Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So at the end of our last presentation on Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural, we mentioned that Jefferson died on the 4th of July, 1826, which was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. But it was not only Thomas Jefferson, as it turned out, John Adams also died on the same day. So think of that remarkable coincidence. You have two of the founding fathers, the two who were perhaps the most responsible for passing the Declaration of Independence through the Continental Congress. You had Jefferson who wrote the Declaration and Adams who was the leader in favor of the Declaration in the debate in Congress. And both of them died on the anniversary of that uh, great political triumph uh, exactly 50 years after the date of the Declaration of Independence. So they died on the Jubilee year and they died together within hours of each other while the nation was celebrating the 50th anniversary of its independence. And so it's not surprising that people thought this was a fairly remarkable coincidence and because these two great founding fathers and early presidents of the United States had both died, in many communities across the nation, there were commemorative events and eulogies offered to remember Adams and Jefferson. But uh, in Boston, it was Daniel Webster who was selected to make that eulogistic address and so at a gathering on the 2nd of August, 1826, in Faneuil Hall, Daniel Webster delivered his famous eulogy to Adams and Jefferson, and that's what we're going to focus on now in this presentation. But first, let's talk a little bit about the orator himself, Daniel Webster. Webster was born in Salisbury, which is now Franklin, New Hampshire. He, he was born in the part of Salisbury that has become part of Franklin. And he was born in 1782 in this small house that's depicted here. You can still go and visit it. It's a national historic site and a state historic site uh, in Franklin, New Hampshire. Um, and at the time that Webster was born, this was on the very edge of the frontier, of the northwest frontier of New Hampshire. There was no civilization beyond where Webster's parents had settled in what was then Salisbury, New Hampshire. When he was a young man, Webster attended Phillips Exeter Academy. He was there only for about a year as he uh, perfected his Latin so that he could pass the entrance exam for Dartmouth College. He graduated from Dartmouth in the class of 1801. Um, and even before he graduated, he was chosen at, after his junior year to be the chief orator on the 4th of July for the town of Hanover. This was a tremendous honor. Usually it was given to a prominent politician, but already Webster had gained a reputation as an outstanding speaker. And so the people of Hanover selected him to give the 4th of July oration in the year 1800. In 1808, he married his first wife, 
um, Grace Fletcher. Webster also taught for a short time after his graduation from Dartmouth. He taught at Freiburg Academy in Maine, and then he returned to New Hampshire and became a lawyer, studied for law, and opened a law office in Boscoin, and then later in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And what I've depicted here on the slide is, first of all, the Daniel Webster House um, and the condition it was in around the 1950s before it was restored and the way it looks now as part of the Strawberry Bank uh, collection of houses and the Strawberry Bank Museum. So you can go and visit the Daniel Webster House in Portsmouth. When Webster was practicing law in Portsmouth, he was also becoming involved in Federalist politics. And during the War of 1812, he wrote what was referred to as the Rockingham Memorial. It was a protest against the war because of the um, difficulty the war was creating for Portsmouth merchants. And so Webster's um, authorship of that Rockingham Memorial drew attention to him, and he was subsequently elected to Congress from New Hampshire in the election of 1812. So he served two terms in Congress as a United States representative from New Hampshire. And then in 1816, in order to grow his law business, he moved to Boston. So obviously he had to resign his position as a congressman from New Hampshire because he no longer lived in the state of New Hampshire. But he had a distinguished political career after his move to Boston. In 1822, he was elected again to Congress, this time from Massachusetts, and in 1827, then elected to the United States Senate. In 1831, he purchased uh, his estate at Marshfield, and that remained his residence in Massachusetts until his death in 1852. Uh, in 1836, he was the Whig candidate for president, obviously did not uh, win the election because he was never president of the United States. He was, in 1841 to 1843, United States Secretary of State under first the short Harrison administration and then the administration of John Tyler. Uh, in 1845, he was again elected to the United States Senate after leaving the position of Secretary of State. He ran for president again in 1848, again as a Whig candidate for president. And in 1850, from 1850 to 1852, he served a second term as United States Secretary of State, this time in the administration of Millard Fillmore. Ran again for president, or at least was put up as a candidate for president in 1852 but he died in October of that year at his home in Marshfield. So Webster is noted perhaps as America's greatest orator. He certainly has some of the greatest speeches ever delivered in American public life. And there's just a few of them listed here, the most famous, but let's talk very briefly about each of them. In 1819, he argued the Dartmouth College case before the United States Supreme Court. The state of New Hampshire had made an attempt to make Dartmouth the first New Hampshire state university by ta basically taking over the private corporation of Dartmouth College. The Board of Trustees of Dartmouth um, disputed the claims of the state of New Hampshire, and the case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Webster argued defending his alma mater and won the case under the Marshall Court in 1819. In 1820, Webster gave the oration at the 200th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims at Plymouth. And this was really his first great epideictic oration. It was made into a pamphlet and widely circulated. It helped to grow Webster's um, reputation as one of America's greatest orators. In 1825, he gave the commemorative oration 
at the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. And on that occasion, the uh, Marquis de Lafayette, who had been uh, a member of Washington's um, staff during the American Revolution, though he was a French nobleman, had returned to America and had laid the ceremonial cornerstone of the Bunker Hill Monument. And Webster spoke on that day to as many as 22,000 people without any amplification or microphone. And it is perhaps the greatest crowd who ever heard an unaided voice of a speaker. And then the following year, he gave his eulogy to Adams and Jefferson. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. In 1830, he gave his most famous deliberative speech, the second reply to Hain, and we will study that as our next address in Great Speakers and Speeches, so we'll reserve comment on that for now. And then also in 1830, Webster argued as a special prosecutor in an infamous murder trial in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, an aging sea captain had been killed in his bed in the middle of the night, and a conspiracy to murder him and inherit his property was uncovered, and Webster was brought in to make sure that the uh, conspirators, who were two brothers known as Joe and Frank Knapp, that the two brothers would not get away with murdering Captain White, even though the person who actually committed the murder, who was hired by the Knapp brothers, had committed suicide in jail. Under Massachusetts law at the time, you could not convict someone of being a conspirator or an accessory to murder unless there was first someone convicted of committing the murder. But they could not convict somebody who committed the murder because the murderer committed suicide in jail. So Webster has this kind of tricky legal puzzle to figure out and does that successfully, um, gaining a conviction of Frank Knapp and then subsequently um, gaining the conviction of Joseph Knapp as an accessory and conspirator. And the two Knapp brothers were hanged for their part in the conspiracy to murder Captain White. In 1833, Webster gives another famous speech on the force bill, and this is a speech in which Webster defines what the United States Constitution means, developing on the kind of argument he makes in the second reply to Hain. And then perhaps uh, his last famous address, the 7th of March address, which he gave during the debate on the Compromise of 1850, called the 7th of March address, because that, of course, is the date on which it is delivered. But Webster makes a dramatic plea trying to avoid a division of the Union as the questions and issues and problems associated with slavery and the spread of slavery and the sectional division of the country become more and more pronounced. We see here depicted a pamphlet uh, that contains two of Webster's epideictic orations, the Bunker Hill Monument Address and the Eulogy to Adams and Jefferson. So famous was Webster as an orator that indeed his orations were widely read in schools and uh, published and distributed to uh, children in schools in short uh, pamphlets like that one that's depicted here. And it remained that way well into the 20th century. Indeed, to enter the University of New Hampshire in the 1890s, we had mentioned that students had to be familiar with Edmund Burke's speech on conciliation, but they also had to write an essay on Daniel Webster's oratorical style. And where they learned that would have been in their grammar school and also in their high school education, reading from pamphlets that contained Webster's famous speeches. So let's take a look at the eulogy to Adams and Jefferson. We said that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on the 4th of July, 1826, which was the 50th anniversary of American independence. Webster gives the speech on the 2nd of August at uh, Faneuil Hall, 
It was the date set for the commemorative celebration of the lives of Adams and Jefferson. And John Adams's son, John Quincy Adams, who is now president of the United States, is present in the audience at Faneuil Hall when Webster speaks. So let's talk about the genre of the speech and also about the rhetorical situation. The genre, of course, is epideictic in its classical mode, but we also know specifically it is a eulogy, and there are also specific generic constraints associated with giving a eulogy. For instance, if you were asked to give the memorial oration or the eulogy at the memorial service of a deceased friend, even if you had never given a eulogy, you would have a pretty good sense of what the constraints were. You would know what the rhetorical situation demanded of you as a eulogist. And so in that sense, we know Webster is operating under some clear generic constraints apart from any other artistic constraints that might be part of the rhetorical situation. So what is the exigence here? We have uh, two of the great founding fathers who died on the same day, and they need to be properly and publicly memorialized. So certainly uh, Webster's task is to, as an orator, uh, to remember Adams and Jefferson and to secure their legacy and their fame with his oration to remind citizens of America in 1826 who these men were and why they are worthy of remembrance. And indeed, we can use Webster's eulogy to Adams and Jefferson to remind ourselves of why John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are worthy for us to remember. So who then was the audience for Webster's address? Certainly, there was in Faneuil Hall a collection of virtually every public dignitary in Massachusetts um, and perhaps also from surrounding states, including the President of the United States, John Quincy Adams, and all of them would have been attentive to everything that Webster said and participated in the commemorative activities of the memorial service. But we can also talk about the more extended audience. And for the extended audience, we would think of, first of all, all the people of 1826 in the United States who would read Webster's eulogy when it was published in the newspaper or when it was printed and distributed in pamphlet form. And then in later generations, throughout the rest of the 19th century, indeed into the 20th century, all those people who would read Webster's eulogy in the collected orations of Daniel Webster. Indeed, we could consider ourselves as part of the audience of Webster's speech because he certainly wants us to remember Adams and Jefferson just as he wanted the members of his immediate audience to remember Adams and Jefferson. Then we can talk about the constraints that existed. We've already mentioned the generic constraints that are associated with, first of all, an epideictic speech, but also specifically the constraints associated with giving a eulogy. And so we expect, for instance, that Webster will say something about the accomplishments of Adams and Jefferson, or that he will praise Adams and Jefferson, that he will remind the people that those uh, principles of government that they establish will live on after them. So these are all parts of the constraints associated with the eulogistic genre. But we also understand that Adams and Jefferson, though they were close allies in the Continental Congress, as we saw in our discussion of Jefferson's first inaugural, were bitter political enemies at a certain point in their career. And so part of the constraint on Webster is to sort of gloss over those political divisions and try to make Adams and Jefferson as much as possible as united in the chief cause of American independence and liberty. And that, of course, is made easier by the occasion of their passing. That is the fact that they both died on the anniversary of American independence in some ways enables Webster to focus mainly on the revolutionary services of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. 
So here are some of the critical questions we can ask about Webster's eulogy to Adams and Jefferson. What aspects of the speech clearly mark it as a classical epideictic effort? So in what ways do we see Webster responding to the epideictic constraints of the occasion? And then more specifically, uh, in what ways does the oration meet the expectations of the eulogistic genre? That is, how is it clearly marked as a eulogy apart from just a general epideictic speech? And so we'll look for those passages in the speech which uh, characterize it as epideictic or as a eulogy. And we can also ask, in what ways might we view Webster as undertaking an important historical task in pronouncing the eulogy? Why were the biographical passages central to the speech? And in a related way, what are the themes of fame and remembrance? Why are they so important to the speech? What motivated Webster himself to be eloquent? So let's talk just very briefly about this before we turn to the speech itself, because when we think about the historical task that Webster faced, we have to remember that there were no professional historians in America in the 1820s. There weren't any departments of history at universities or colleges. And so history was done usually by uh, well-educated public men. And Webster, as an epideictic orator, took that task seriously. And so people learned about the past. They learned about the revolution. They learned about the founding fathers, not mainly by reading histories of the revolution, but by reading epideictic orations like that that Webster gives on this occasion. So he has to include within the speech those biographical passages, not only to mark and remember the services of Adams and Jefferson, but to help instruct or educate his fellow Americans about why those two founding fathers are worthy of remembrance. And then related is the idea of fame and remembrance. This is an important text in public memory. That is, the way in which we remember Adams and Jefferson is in many ways crafted or shaped by Webster's eulogistic efforts and by the efforts of many other eulogists in other parts of the country as well. But it is up to the orator in his eulogy to secure the fame of the founding fathers. That is to make sure they are remembered and remembered for the right things and in the right way. And also it's true that Webster, in giving an eloquent eulogy, is also contributing to his own uh, renown or fame or remembrance as an orator. Indeed, the fact that we're reading this speech many, many years later in a course on great speakers and speeches speaks to that impulse by Webster to be eloquent so he could say something memorable and in that way help to secure not only the fame of Adams and Jefferson, but his own fame as well. Then we could ask, how do Webster's remarks on true eloquence provide an interesting critical perspective on his own work? We'll see as we'll look at that passage where he reflects on what true eloquence is. We can read that certainly within the context of the address as referring to the speaking of John Adams, but it also indirectly and by implication is a way for Webster to characterize what he understands his own rhetoric is all about. And that relates also to this next question about why Webster composes a fictional oration for Adams in the midst of his eulogy. You'll recognize as you read the speech that there's a place where Webster creates a fictional Adams address. Adams spoke at the Continental Congress in favor of the Declaration of Independence, but there was no stenographer present and no transcript made of those debates. So nobody really knows what Adams actually said. Adams himself didn't write it down. He spoke in the midst of a heated debate. And because we have no record of what Adams said, that speech is in effect lost to history. But Webster recreates it in the context of his eulogy. He creates for Adams an address 
like the one he would have given in 1776. And he does that for a number of reasons. I think, first of all, we can see that Webster creates this speech as a text that balances the text of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. So we have Jefferson writing the Declaration and then Adams defending the Declaration in the debate in Congress. But then we also have the importance that Webster wants to emphasize, the importance of oratory in American political life. We have Jefferson's text, which is a written text, and so Webster wants to also emphasize that speech is at least equally important. And so he creates for Adams an oration, such as the orations that Webster himself would have given or did give in his political career, emphasizing the importance of spoken rhetoric in the American political experiment. We see here, by the way, our first photograph, so to speak, of any of the great orators we're going to study. This was a very early daguerreotype photograph of Daniel Webster, taken near the end of his life, probably in the 1850s. So before we look at the speech itself, let's take a look at the essay I wrote on this speech, published in a collection of essays on 19th century American public address. And uh, it reflects in particular on that fictional Adams address and how that fictional address works within the overall eulogy to Adams and Jefferson. As this uh, introductory paragraph explains, the fictional address is the space where Webster's artistic and historical strategies come into sharp focus. And in particular, one way of reading that fictional address is to read it as an example of each of the four master tropes that Kenneth Burke writes about. Those four master tropes, metaphor, metonymy, synecdoche, and irony. So I undertake a critical analysis of the speech, looking at the speech through the perspective of these four master tropes as a way of discovering what it was that Webster was aiming to accomplish in his eulogy to Adams and Jefferson, and in particular in his construction or crafting of a fictional address for John Adams. So in that argument, one of the things I observed is that the inclusion of the Adams speech is demanded by a sense of structural balance. The overall eulogy to Adams and Jefferson has a striking sense of balance to it. So as we read it, for instance, you see there's a section on the early career of John Adams, and that's followed by a section on the early political career and education of Thomas Jefferson. So it's that balancing of Jefferson and Adams, Adams and Jefferson spoken of one and the other as if they're parallel lives. And so the imaginary speech, as it says here in the second passage, the imaginary speech for John Adams serves as the counterweight to Jefferson's declaration and helps preserve the balanced structure of the eulogy. Moreover, the fictional address reminds us that both writing and speech were necessary to justify independence and define the revolution. And then further, observation here now applying the perspective of those various master tropes four master tropes of uh, Kenneth Burke pointing out that the speech acts as a reduction of the abstract virtue of eloquence to the concrete action of speech and so here we're reflecting on Webster's use of metonymy that figure of speech that we introduced with the discussion of the Fisher Ames speech right but this is the, in this case the association of a concrete act with an abstract idea. So we have this abstract virtue of eloquence. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, we can reduce that abstract virtue to a concrete action of speech, but only if we have a text. And so that creation, the crafting of the fictional speech allows for that um, materialization of the virtue, the abstract virtue of eloquence in the speech. 
And then further on, um, the composition by Webster further alters our perspective on the original Adam speech by demanding a consciousness of the text as artistic performance. So we know that Adams argued about the Declaration, about having a revolution in the Continental Congress. He probably was not terribly concerned with how he sounded or the aesthetics of his address, but now in the recreation of that speech by Webster, we are focused on the speech as an artistic performance. In, an, in other words, the speech becomes an instance of embodied eloquence, this notion of reducing the abstract virtue to the concrete action of speech. And that has a couple of effects. One of it focuses more attention on the artistic qualities of the speech by John Adams, but it also reminds us that Webster himself was mainly an orator. And so by emphasizing the artistic performance of oratory, it helps Webster to sustain his own public standing as America's greatest orator. And then the essay that I wrote also comments on the ways in which the eulogy to Adams and Jefferson conforms to the generic expectations of that genre. Kathleen Jameson, who wrote on the eulogistic genre, talks about what the constraints are on an orator who must give a eulogy. And we find in the Adams and Jefferson eulogy that Webster participates in this generic tradition. Indeed, the eulogistic psychology described by Jameson would seem to form the emotional foundation for Webster's oration. And then we also note that it's important in uh, undertaking that main historical task of contributing to public memory that Webster um, takes on that task in part by creating a dramatic context for the fictional Adam speech. So Webster creates not only the fictional Adams address, but a fictional speech for an opponent of independence. And that opponent is essential to create the drama of a heroic triumph for John Adams. So let's take a look at some of the passages of Daniel Webster's eulogy to Adams and Jefferson. First, in the opening, we see his attention to the constraints of the eulogistic genre. This is an unaccustomed spectacle, he says. For the first time, fellow citizens, badges of mourning shroud the columns and overhang the arches of this hall. He's talking about Faneuil Hall. These walls, which were consecrated so long ago to the cause of American liberty, which witnessed her infant struggles and rung with the shouts of her earliest victories, proclaim now that distinguished friends and champions of that great cause have fallen. It is right that it should be thus. The tears which flow and the honors that are paid when the founders of the Republic die give hope that the Republic itself may be immortal. And so we see Webster attending to the immediate exigence of having to praise those dead who uh, are the subjects of his eulogy and remarking on the eulogistic occasion that is present in Faneuil Hall. And then he also, not surprisingly, comments in the eulogy on what we might call the providential deaths of Adams and Jefferson, the remarkable coincidence of both of them dying on the 4th of July on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Americans almost universally took this as a sign of God's special blessing for America. It was a sign that America was, as we talked about in the context of Jefferson's inaugural, that America was set apart to be a shining city on a hill or an example for the rest of the world. And this remarkable coincidence of the deaths of Adams and Jefferson confirmed that for Americans alive in 1826. So as Webster says, the concurrence of their death on the anniversary of independence has naturally awakened stronger emotions. Both had been presidents, 
both had lived to great age, both were early patriots, and both were distinguished and ever honored by their immediate agency in the act of independence. It cannot but seem striking and extraordinary that these two should live to see the 50th year from the date of that act, that they should complete that year, and that then, on the day which had fast linked forever their own fame with their country's glory, the heavens should open to receive them both at once. Then, of course, again as part of the eulogistic genre, Webster finds multiple ways in which he can assure Americans that the work of Adams and Jefferson lives on, that it continues in the perpetuation of the republic itself. No two men now live, fellow citizens. Perhaps it may be doubted whether any two men have ever lived in one age who, more than those we now commemorate, have impressed on mankind their own sentiments in regard to politics and government, infused their own opinions more deeply into the opinions of others, or given a more lasting direction to the current of human thought. Their work doth not perish with them. And then, as we discussed in connection with the balanced overall structure of the eulogy, Webster approaches his historical task by discussing the lives of Adams and Jefferson in parallel form, much in the way, for instance, that the ancient writer Plutarch wrote his parallel lives. There were, Webster points out, many points of similarity in the lives and fortunes of these great men. They belonged to the same profession and had pursued its studies and its practice for unequal lengths of time indeed, but with diligence and effect. Both were learned and able lawyers. They were natives and inhabitants respectively of, the two, of those two of the colonies which at the revolution were the largest and most powerful and which naturally had a lead in the political affairs of the times. When the colonies became in some degree united by the assembling of a general congress, they were brought to act together in its deliberations, not indeed at the same time, but both at early periods. Each had already manifested his attachment to the cause of the country, as well as his ability to maintain it by printed addresses, public speeches, extensive correspondence, and whatever other mode could be adopted for the purpose of exposing the encroachments of the British Parliament and animating the people to a manly resistance. Both were not only decided, but early friends of independence. So we talked about one of the constraints for Webster's address was the fact that Adams and Jefferson later in their political careers had become bitter rivals. Certainly in their retirement, they had renewed their correspondence and become more friendly. But it is also the case that that election of 1800 was very bitter, and both of them resented what the other had done in that election. And so Webster has to kind of gloss over that. And one of the ways he does that is emphasizing the things that they did together, or that each of them had done, or that both of them had shared, or how they had acted together by emphasizing these, as he calls them, many points of similarity, Webster can transcend those moments of division in the political careers of Adams and Jefferson. And we also note the important task of Webster as the public historian. So as he introduces the lives of Adams and Jefferson, he tells us the occasion, fellow citizens, requires some account of the lives and services of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. So Webster is recognizing the epideictic constraint on him, the importance of, of insisting that these men be remembered in the right way, and the importance of the orator contributing to public memory about Adams and Jefferson. He talks about it as a duty. He says this duty must necessarily be performed with great brevity 
and in the discharge of it, I shall be obliged to confine myself principally to those parts of their history and character which belong to them as public men. But nevertheless, we see Webster taking quite seriously that duty of the public historian, the one responsible for public memory. And he gives a rather detailed account of the lives and careers of both Adams and Jefferson in the eulogy. Then we have the portion right before Webster introduces the fictional Adams speech, which is a kind of dissertation of sorts on true eloquence. He means this, of course, in reference to the speech of John Adams or to the character of John Adams as an orator, but he also means it as a general reflection on eloquence, which leads us back to think about how it might apply to Webster's own speech himself. The eloquence of Mr. Adams resembled his general character and formed indeed a part of it. It was bold, manly, and energetic, and such as the crisis required. True eloquence indeed does not consist in speech. It cannot be brought from far. Labor and learning may toil for it, but they will toil in vain. Words and phrases may be marshaled in every way, but they cannot compass it. It must exist in the man, in the subject, and in the occasion. The graces taught in the schools, the costly ornaments and studied contrivances of speech, shock and disgust men when their own lives and the fate of their wives, their children, and their country hang on the decision of the hour. Then words have lost their power. Rhetoric is vain and all elaborate oratory contemptible. Then patriotism is eloquent. Then self-devotion is eloquent. The clear conception, outrunning the deductions of logic, the high purpose, the firm resolve, the dauntless spirit, speaking on the tongue, beaming from the eye, informing every feature and urging the whole man onward, right onward to his object. This, this is eloquence, or rather, it is something greater and higher than all eloquence. It is action, noble, sublime, godlike action. Now, of course, this gives us a number of things to think about. We know, for instance, that Webster at Dartmouth studied rhetoric, studied classical rhetoric. He knew very well what he calls here the studied contrivances of speech or the rhetoric that's taught in the schools, right? But it also reminds us that Webster himself finds eloquence to be an essential virtue for a public person. And he wants this uh, dissertation on eloquence to reflect not only on John Adams, but on Daniel Webster himself as the public orator of his own day. But it's interesting at another level as well. It's actually somewhat ironic that Webster talks about how the eloquence of John Adams exists in the man, in the subject, and in the occasion, and that it's not part of the studied contrivances of speech, right? Or that rhetoric is in vain. And yet at the same time, this fictional address that's created by Daniel Webster is created through those studied contrivances of speech. The fictional address is pre-crafted by Webster. It is not a response to a particular crisis situation. So in some ways, the speech that he creates for John Adams cannot meet the very criteria that Webster himself outlines here. It cannot be eloquent in the same exact way that uh, Webster defines. However, one of the brilliant aspects of the Webster speech, and especially of the fictional Adams address that he creates, one of the brilliant elements of that is that we don't even notice that it doesn't fit the definition of eloquence because Webster has recreated that dramatic scene. And so we're focused just on how John Adams responds to that scene rather than thinking about this as a recreation, an artistic creation of Daniel Webster 50 years later. So let's turn to that portion where Webster introduces the drama of the debate in the Continental Congress. He says to his audience and to us, 
let us then bring before us the assembly which was about to decide a question thus big with the fate of empire. Let us open their doors and look in upon their deliberations. Let us survey the anxious and careworn countenances. Let us hear the firm-toned voices of this band of patriots. Hancock presides over the solemn sitting, and one of those not yet prepared to pronounce for absolute independence is on the floor and is urging his reasons for dissenting from the Declaration. So this, I think, is vital for Webster's overall task. He creates this dramatic scene and puts this recreation of the scene in between the dissertation on eloquence and the fictional Adams address. And it allows us then to experience the Adams speech as if it is occurring in the moment, as if it is a response in the man, in the subject, in the occasion, as Webster says true eloquence is. And so we also see the creation here of the fictional speech by the opponent of independence, which adds to the drama of the occasion when we're introduced to the fictional Adams speech. And it's quite an eloquent address, and we won't have time to do the whole fictional Adams speech within the Webster eulogy here, but the famous opening line, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, I give my hand and my heart to this vote. And then as the closing or peroration of the Adams address occurs, but whatever may be our fate, be assured, be assured that this declaration will stand. It may cost treasure and it may cost blood, but it will stand and it will richly compensate for both. Through the thick gloom of the present, I see the brightness of the future as the sun in heaven. We shall make this a glorious and immortal day. When we are in our graves, our children will honor it. They will celebrate it with thanksgiving, with festivity, with bonfires and illuminations. On its annual return, they will shed tears, copious gushing tears, not of subjection and slavery, not of agony and distress, but of exultation, of gratitude and of joy. Sir, before God, I believe the hour is come. My judgment approves this measure and my whole heart is in it. All that I have and all that I am and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready here to stake upon it and I leave off as I have begun, that live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. It is my living sentiment, and by the blessing of God it shall be my dying sentiment, independence now, and independence forever. So the passages I have highlighted here, it's interesting to note, are actually taken from words that John Adams wrote that description of the future celebrations of independence with thanksgiving and festivity and bonfires and illuminations, that comes from a letter that Adams wrote to his wife on the 3rd of July, 1776, after the vote for independence had taken place the day before. And then that closing expression, independence now and independence forever, was... Uh, sometimes attributed to John Adams as his dying words, although they were not actually. His dying words were Thomas Jefferson still survives. He didn't know that Jefferson had died earlier that morning. But in any case, these were the last words that Adams offered for public consumption when the fathers of the town of Quincy, Massachusetts, invited him to the public celebration of the Jubilee of Independence he declined their invitation, but sent along a toast to be read in his name, and that toast was independence now and independence forever. So impressive was this fictional Adams address created by Daniel Webster in his eulogy to Adams and Jefferson that the speech by Adams itself was reprinted on its own in school readers and anthologies of speeches. And even into many later generations, there was some confusion about whether John Adams actually uttered these words or if in fact they were the fictional 
creation of Daniel Webster. But Webster's brilliance as an orator is in evidence here because we really don't even notice that it is in fact a fictional speech within another speech. We just focus on the dramatic occasion and Adams's words in debate in favor of the Declaration of Independence. And then finally, as Webster closes, we see a theme that is common in many of Webster's speeches and especially in his epideictic orations, and that is the great chain of being or the link between generations past and generations future with the present generation. And it reminds us that in so much of what Webster did and indeed in so many of these great orations, that the orators are thinking about us when they're speaking, that they have in mind how their words will influence or impact not only their own day, but all future generations. And so Webster speaks to his audience in 1826 and reminds them, and now fellow citizens, let us not retire from this occasion without a deep and solemn conviction of the duties which have devolved upon us. This lovely land, this glorious liberty, these benign institutions, the dear purchase of our fathers are ours, ours to enjoy, ours to preserve, ours to transmit. Generations past and generations to come hold us responsible for this sacred trust. Our fathers from behind admonish us with their anxious paternal voices. Posterity calls out to us from the bosom of the future the world turns hither its solicitous eyes. All, all conjure us to act wisely and faithfully in the relation which we sustain. We can never indeed pay the debt which is upon us, but by virtue, by morality, by religion, by the cultivation of every good principle and every good habit, we may hope to enjoy the blessing through our day and to leave it unimpaired to our children. So we who are Webster's posterity, we of later generations, are in effect asked to judge the people of his day, to judge Daniel Webster and to say, did they do that? Did they transmit the blessings of liberty and all the other blessings of our country? Did they transmit them to us unimpaired, right? So Webster is inviting us to enter into that chain of the generations, but also to judge how well those in his generation lived up to their responsibility. So that's a good place to sort of end our reflection on the eulogy to Adams and Jefferson by Daniel Webster given on the 2nd of August, 1826. I'll end here with an image of my visit to the Webster birthplace this past July and uh, ask if you have any questions or comments on the eulogy to Adams and Jefferson that you post them to the discussion board.